Hello, everyone, and welcome to the long and winding Royal Road. My name is W.H. Park, and uh, this is episode 25 of the LNWRR, the show that looks back at 1990s All Japan Pro Wrestling, in my humble estimation, the greatest period of in-ring action ever to exist in the history of professional wrestling. And uh, today we're going to look at a very special match between two of the uh, most important people in the history of All Japan Pro Wrestling, and that would be Mitsuhara Masawa taking on Toshi Akikawada for the first time ever for the Triple Crown. So uh, joining me on today's review is someone who doesn't normally talk about professional wrestling here at Post Wrestling. Uh, they usually talk about mixed martial arts, usually the, the UFC and uh, other promotions, including the, I think, the Pillow Fight League. And that would be Eric Marcotte. Eric, how are you? Uh, I'm doing absolutely fantastic, uh, wonderful, fabulous, even. Uh, good to be here, WH. Yes. So just for <laughs> the sake of uh, uh, transparency, I think that's the word I'm looking for. It this is. is our second second attempt at recording this. <laughs> because for some, on my end at least, I was having some uh, difficulty hearing Eric. Uh, don't know if it's because of me or because of him. Who knows? But I, I, I had to stop the recording and restart it so this is our second attempt at doing this show and hopefully we will have uh no issues that's why eric's like kind of laughing there but um there, but there's yeah. a lost 50 minutes out there and listen wh and i can both say that's the greatest 50 minutes that have ever been recorded there, there is some stuff on that thing that that lost audio that's in the ether now that people when they hurt when, when if they ever heard it would be like trying like getting out the, the the torches and the pitchforks looking for me probably you know some of them are fellow members of the post wrestling community they know who i'm talking about but uh but yes we we we, we shan't cry over uh spilt milk there eric uh a few tears might be shed but but not too much because no. we still have a, a tremendous match to talk into talk That's about right. here that's right. So uh, for the listeners, like, so it, they, who might be familiar with you, usually you're talking about MMA, but you are a fan of pro wrestling as well. Uh, correct. Yes. Yes. And, and uh, what is like, uh, what kind of history do you have with uh, all Japan pro wrestling is particularly from, from this era. If we're talking 90s all Japan, really, what I would say is if you went onto a site like Cage Match and you just looked at up the uh, the highest rated matches on the site, the ones that appear right at the top from all Japan, those are the ones I've seen. So I'm a pretty novice all Japan viewer, I'd say. But uh, but the match we're going to talk about, which would be uh, Misawa versus Kawada from uh, the date of October 21st, 1992. This would have been your first time watching this particular match. Yeah, I had never seen this match before this feeling. Okay, and then we're gonna we're gonna get your thoughts on this match, obviously, and then and, and kind of get your overall impressions at the, at the end of this review. But uh, are what 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 you have seen from all Japan? Like, what is it that that uh, you find enjoyable about it? If if you find it enjoyable, I definitely find it enjoyable. Although to be fair, like I said, the matches I've seen from it are considered some of the greatest matches in the history of the industry. So I'm I only watch the best of the best. But the well, you know, before we even talk about the in-ring action, the atmosphere for these events is always incredible. And the in-ring action, hard hitting, uh, well, dangerous at points, but that's kind of part of the appeal for being honest with ourselves. Right. And the storytelling is fantastic. Yeah, I think what what what's the phrase that some people like to put out there? The, the safety police. I'm, I'm certainly not a member of the safety police per se but you know what like i understand like i've been in in wrestling shows and i've been in you know at matches where like i almost thought you know oh my god did that person like seriously injure themselves to the point of like maybe paralysis or even near death and i that's not a fun experience and i don't like seeing it on television necessarily i think there is a way to to Yes, I, I'm going to say this. I think there's a way to do this style <laughs> and and be as safe as you can in wrestling. I mean, people have died. Yes, Misawa is the person who has died because of um, a lot of things, including working this style. But like, here's the thing is like, 
Kawada, Tawei, Kobashi have not died. They got out and, you know, and there's always going to be wear and tear on people's bodies. It doesn't matter what style of wrestling you do, whether it's American, Japanese, or Lucha Libre, there's people are going to come out of wrestling banged up and not being able to uh, have full use of their body as it were, Eric. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously it's a business that has very high risks, high stakes whenever you get into the ring and it doesn't even necessar- uh, necessarily dictate wrestling a style like this. We've seen people work uh, much safer styles in ring and uh, there have obviously been very unfortunate things that have happened. So yeah. it's just part of the business. It is. It's part of it's part of the fandom too, you know, like for us to watch it. It's like I, I still love watching this style like going back to to watching old footage of it or even like in, in you know 2022 that people still do this kind of like king's road style in in japan and in, in america and hey you know if they can do it and they come out of it relatively unscathed and i'm happy yeah no i mean it's a really interesting point that you bring up here like personally like my, my personal favorite match ever would be uh kazuchika okada and katsuri shibata and that's, of course, the match where Shibata does the headbutt and it nearly dies, right? Effectively ends his career up until recently. So uh, it, it's a thing where you have to balance the the guilt with the enjoyment, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I I still, I can watch that match knowing, so that, can I. <laughs> knowing that ultimately he does not die. And then ho- hopefully he'll, he can come back to the ring in, in some kind of capacity. You know, that would be great. I, if, if, it's, if he's in danger, don't. It's not worth it. You know, that, that would be what I would say. But Masao versus Kawada, 10-21-92. Let, let's talk about some background for this match. Um, to, to get this title shot. So at the time, Masawa is the Triple Crown champion. He has just beaten uh, Stan Hansen for it. Then this is his first time with, with the Triple Crown. And uh, for Kawada to get this title shot, he had to face his former, uh, sorry, not his former, but his future tag team partner in Akira Tawe on September 9th, 1992. And uh, he, he wins this, this, uh, this number one contenders match that a lot of people, a lot of fans would think that, okay, Tawe is going to win it because keep in mind at this point in time, Kawada is Masawa's regular tag team partner. They have been the world team ch- tag team champions and they will be the world tag team champions again in the future. Uh, before this match and after this match. So it, it's not like they had a split or anything like that. No, just Kawada. Uh, you know, maybe a lot of people thought Kawada was going was to be kind of like the gatekeeper for Tawe. Like Tawe would get the, 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 the match to face Masawa, but Kawada would have softened him up, so to speak, for his, for his leader, for, for Masawa here. But that's not what happened. In fact, Kawada be- beats Tawe. And then it's like, okay, these guys who are tag team partners, who are best friends, are now going to face each other for these titles. And I, I think that's such a, is it, if, if it's, if that's deliberate on, on Baba's giant Baba's part, which I think it would be, then that's, I think that's a really great way to like, kind of, you know, give the fans something that they didn't expect, but they, but they probably wanted. Uh, agreed completely. And there is no question about what they wanted from the reaction to, to Kawada that we'll get in this match. And the entire match really does play off their relationship and subverts your expectations in some ways. Um, I want to talk about their their tag team uh, with uh, with uh, with the context of their the titles that they they would win. They were world tag team champions uh, twice. Once from July twenty fourth to December sixth, nineteen ninety two, they uh, win the belts from the Miracle Violence Connection of Terry Gordy and Steve Williams. They have uh, one successful defense against Jumbo Saruta and Akira Tawe on September fourth, nineteen ninety one. The uh, before losing the titles back to Gordy and Williams on December sixth, nineteen ninety one. Uh, their second reign would happen a couple of months after this match on December fourth. 1992 in the real world tag league tournament finals uh they would defeat the team of akira tawe and a young june akiyama and then they would lose the titles to gordy william gordy and williams on january 30th uh 1993 so like for not 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 a very long range their their second run with the belts less just about over a month there um and yeah, like they, have you ever seen any of their tag team matches, like Misawa and Kawada as a tag team? Uh, Misawa and Kawada? No, I haven't seen them together before. They they are they are a great team. 
Like they, they're great. They're better rivals, but they have an awesome team. And I would highly recommend recommend people check out any of the matches they have against the Miracle Violence Connection or against Jumbo Saruta and Akira Tawe. Just some excellent, excellent matches there with them as as a tag team, actually. Uh, Kawada um, has had chances at the Triple Crown before this match. Eric, he's he's faced Jumbo Saruta on uh, October 24th, 1981, and, and came up short there against Jumbo. He also faced uh, Stan Hansen on uh, uh, June 5th of, of the 1992 as well, and, and he failed in that, in that challenge as, as well. Um, for Misawa, again, I, this is his first reign uh, with the Triple Crown, and this reign is a very, very long reign. It, it, it lasts from 1992, from August 22nd, 1992, uh, where he wins the title from Steve Williams until July 28th, 1994, where he loses it to uh, Steve Williams. And so he's kind of a, a precursor to uh, Roman Reigns uh, in his current uh, reign as the, <laughs> the WWE Universal Undisputed, whatever the fuck it is, title he, he holds right now. Uh, that's a great comparison, WA. That is a great comparison. In, in our first time I've heard it today. <laughs> no, actually, you made that comparison, and I said, "Hey, this Masawa in this case holds a wrestling title, and Roman holds a sports entertainment title." There were a lot of shots taken during this uh, these minutes of lost lost audio. <laughs> Listen, I I like Roman, but l- let's be honest: the Triple Crown in ni- the nineties is greater than the. You know, the Triple Crown anytime really is greater than the WWE world title in the last, oh, I don't know how long, <laughs> you know. Uh, ever, maybe? Uh, I wouldn't say ever. I'm not going to go that far say ever. I'm just going to say for the last, oh, like, because it's not, it's, it's not a wrestling company anymore. That's what I say. It's not a wrestling company. That's just my feeling. Um, in this very long two-year reign, Masawa has seven successful defenses, uh, three of them against Kawada. Uh, of course this match uh, so spoiler everyone Kawada doesn't win the title in this match uh also on July 29th in 1993 and on uh June 3rd uh 1994 which is probably their their most famous match and the one people allowed the most uh over over any other match and and I said in our original conversation Eric that uh, you know maybe I will do these these matches in uh, as part of kind of a mini series over the over the course of the maybe the next uh, year or so, just to like with different people, just to like you know have a kind of the Kawada Misawa series of the first title reign. And in response, I said that was a very good idea, and yes, uh, I maintain that opinion. There you go, there you go. Um, and when the match starts, I, I, I think it was really interesting to to note that the announcers declare this a quote unquote dream match, um, because of the fact that Misawa and Kawada, like I said, have been allies and they've been tag team partners for over two years now in Super Generation Army. And the last time they ever had a singles match with one another was nine years earlier. So in that time, in for nine years, Eric, they've been in the same company. The roster is not that varied, but they have never even faced each other in a singles match in, in, in a tournament or for like some like exhibition match or anything like that it's amazing uh absolutely remarkable being able to keep uh guys away from each other for so long especially given the prevalence of things like tournaments like you mentioned and whatnot that uh you wouldn't be planning this nine years ahead obviously they were nine years before this match i didn't sit down and say oh, let's keep these guys apart for nine years and build up to this match now it, a lot of coincidence plays into that and couple that with smart booking and it leads to a really big match like we had here well the other thing we have to keep in mind like okay they haven't touched in a singles match for nine years they've been partners for the last two years but also we have to take into account like their own like personal history with one another, like it goes beyond wrestling. So uh, keep in mind, Masawa and Kawada attended the same high school uh, with Masawa being ahead by one year and thus being the senior or senpai in their relationship. Uh, This is mirrored also in their professional wrestling careers as Masawa starts his training in the All Japan Dojo one year earlier and before Kawada, and it's always ahead of Kawada by about one year. And this, this translates to when they make their debuts. Masawa goes on excursion before Kawada. Masawa comes back before Kawada. Baba 
you know, promotes him or, and elevates Masawa before before he does with Kawada. But th- at the same time, you have to keep in mind that Kawada's progression as a professional wrestler is probably, I'd say, the same as as Masawa. Like he's getting as good as Masawa is and 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 wrestling at a level maybe not on a star level but at on on in-ring level like it's very very close like maybe masao is just a little bit better like like objectively in the ring but kawada is pretty fucking awesome in his own right as well and that real life relationship and progression kind of plays itself out throughout their rivalry in in the in the 90s as well you can say yeah and and to put also like another kind of like layer on top of this rivalry that they will eventually like, you know, that will eventually blossom throughout the, you know, the 1990s after this match is that, you know, for, for Masawa, he's, when he's a young, young, young wrestler, he's put under the mentorship of, you know, the ace of the company at the time, who is uh, Jumbo Saruta. And Kawada is then placed in, under, the, under the mentorship of uh, Jumbo's, main rival and the lead you know like kind of the one one b to jumbo's one a and that's jenny tro tenru so it, so like kawada and misao's mentors are rivals with one another and this is kind of revisited to misao and kawada and it's, it's also interesting because the the relationship with saruta and tenru is very similar they were tag team partners they split they became rivals they would feud over the triple crown uh many times so it's, it's a really interesting how this kind of is is a kind of a legacy feud almost yep it plays out uh, very similarly you can suppose i don't know what what you'd call that it's um it's not a coincidence it's uh I've lost the word for it right now. My apologies. Well, what, when it comes back to you, Eric, you can yeah, when it comes just chime back in. To chime uh, in. In the, ori- in the original audio, lost for all. I don't even think you said anything about this. In the- <laughs> I, don't, I don't know either. <laughs> just using that as an excuse. Um, but yeah, this is a very, this is a very like common <laughs> formula that, that a lot of like um, Japanese promotions like to use to build like kind of generational rivalries with people. So like, you know, you see it in Jumbo versus versus uh, uh, Jumbo versus Tenru. Then it's visited again with Masawa and Kawada. And then I would say famously in in like uh, New Japan, like most recent New Japan would be like kind of this a similar thing was done with uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi and Shinsuke Nakamura, where they were first like you know paired together as a tag team. They were IWGP tag team champions. Then they split, and then they became eternal rivals with one another they're uh, generating so many classic matches between between them for for primarily for the you know iwgp uh world title or or for maybe like a, a spot uh, to to advance in the g1 climax or something like that but uh it, it is it, it's it's not an uncommon thing to see this kind of like formula play out in in any type of japanese wrestling promotion I mean, it's a very like easy to tell story, especially when it's playing off uh, real life relationships as uh, as it does in the match that we're about to talk about. Yes, that's correct. So let's let's talk about the match. Let's let's quickly go through some some details of where this match took place. It was it emanated from the the Nippon Budokan, uh, one of my favorite buildings to have ever watched wrestling in. From October twenty first, nineteen ninety two, this is the last show of All Japan's twentieth anniversary Giant Series tour, and uh, the attendance. Attendance is listed as 16,300 people. And, and Eric, you know, in our original audio, we both commented that we can believe that this attendance figure is probably true. It's not probably not a worked attendance figure because, you know, All Japan was actually selling out Budokan uh, Hall on a regular basis starting from about this time period. And, and this crowd, like just from the audio alone, like you, it, it is like unbelievable how loud this crowd is. It definitely sounded like there were over 16,000 people in there. And uh, yeah, you know what? In our original audio, I went over the, uh, the, the card the results. I'm not going to do that just to save time. <laughs> but if, if you want, you can go to Cage Match, the, the site that Eric referenced, a great site, a great resource for any wrestling fan. And you can look up October 21st, 1992, All Japan Pro Wrestling. And you can find the results of this card. But I, I will say this, the, we, 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 were, we were especially impressed with the... Uh, the semi-main event of Andre the Giant, Jumbo Suruta, and Terry Gordy taking on the team of Dory Funk Jr., <laughs> Giant Baba, and Stan Hansen. 
a match that lasted just 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 under 15 minutes and i i can't even imagine what five minutes of that looked like i'm sure it was a, an absolute classic in 1992 <laughs> yes i mean you had the point that if it was a if andre the giant like was around in 2022 pro wrestling no he would he would probably be pushed to the moon oh man i i feel uh the tears are being shed again for the loss of some of us so this so, gold absolute gold 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 all right <laughs> let's let's get to it though eric mitsuhara masawa takes on toshiaki kawada for misawa's triple crown title and uh right off the bat kawada shows He's he's not fucking around. He's super serious. He wants to beat Masawa for this title. And he immediately just hits Masawa with the back drop driver suplex, drops Masawa on his noggin, and pops this crowd into a frenzy two minutes into this match. Uh it was a brutal drop, too. Like he did he did not gently lie the man on his back. No, it was like uh, nearly head first, and the crowd explodes. Uh just sets the tone for the match. This isn't just gonna be a, a friendly sparring match between tag partners. No. Uh Kawada tries to follow up this move with a kick, but Masawa blocks it and and he goes for his signature elbow, but uh, Kawada wisely steps back to avoid it. Uh, they lock up again, and Kawada grabs Misawa's left arm, which I should note is not his dominant arm. It's not the one he throws elbows with. It's not the one with the elbow pad on it. And he goes for an arm bar takedown. Uh, Kawada maintains control of the arm with, with several arm bar takedowns, and he works over the arm by dropping knees on it and locking in a hammerlock. And, and I made a point earlier that I don't know, like for me, I, I think I would have, you know, the, the, the better story would be to go after the right arm, the dominant arm, the elbow, elbow strike arm. But you made a point uh, kind of like seeing kind of a logic in, in him working the left arm here. I did. I thought if you're looking at it from a first match perspective, knowing that Masawa was winning, I think it actually makes sense to have Kawada work uh, the left arm in the first match. And as these guys, uh, their rivalry progresses, he can acknowledge, like from a KFA perspective, obviously, that his strategy in their first match was poor. And he can attack the right arm in the future. So I actually really like the idea of him going after the left arm in this initial matchup. Uh, Masawa gets out of the hammerlock, but Kawada quickly regains control of Masawa uh, with a drop to hold. And then from, from this drop to hold, he decides to kick Masawa in the back really stiffly. And this pisses off Masawa. From here, uh, the, these two lock up again, and Kawada takes control with uh, different types of arm submissions. Um, but Masawa forces a rope break, and this, which uh, makes Kawada go for another submission attempt. Masawa again forces the rope, rope break. And this time, Kawada decides, I'm going to knee Masawa in the nose. Okay. And, and from this, it's like no more fucking around from Masawa now. And he unloads a flurry of elbows to Kawada's face. And some of them look pretty fucking stiff. Uh, yeah, these looked like they fucking hurt. I mean, he he was laying these in, and I thought in doing so, he really uh, did a great job of expression, expressing his uh, frustration at that point in the match after the initial five or so minutes. Yeah, and even even from that, you know, that first backdrop suplex, he's not. He doesn't look angry. He looks more like surprised, you know, at at Kawada. Agreed. That he did and I- that. It's not until this point of the match, I'd say, what what are we like five seven minutes in, like that he's like. Now he's mad. Like the the stoicism of Masawa has been broken, and and he is now just like he okay fuck you Kawada. Let you want to do it? Let's do it. Um. So he's throwing these elbows at Kawada's face. He also throws in uh, a healthy you know helping of stomps, kicks, and forearms to Kawada. Uh. He snap mares Kawada and then starts working over his back which is you know like if you think about masawa's like you know finishers one of them is the tiger driver which you know like you know works on the back by dropping your opponent on their back and knocking the wind out of them to hopefully get a one two three um you know from from here uh you know there are several attempts at escape from from kawada until he finally succeeds by doing a jumping double back kick to to uh to masawa and uh in you know originally we even talked about like like for a man Kawada size, he's he's like a, I don't know, like listed about like 250, 260, you know, but I maybe realistically more like 240, 250. 
But even at 240, this man is a big dude. And he's able to do like some pretty, uh, pretty impressive, like jumping back, like jumping types of kicks in his, in his matches. Like honestly, both of these men, when you look at their physique, their size, they will blow you away in terms of their athleticism that they display uh, really in all of their matches. And also we had to talk about the cardio <laughs> these guys have. It's pretty amazing. Like, Oh, absolutely ridiculous the things that they do and these are long matches these are almost always long matches and uh the pace that they keep throughout the vast majority of them is uh remarkable uh the kawada masawa then go for a, a greco-roman knuckle lock and kawada quickly gets the advantage and takes masawa's back and tries going for a sleeper hold or a rear naked choke and as our our resident mma expert here at at post wrestling uh eric like uh how how, how do you rate uh kawada's technique at the rear naked choke here uh so what i said in, in our initial thing and i'll kind of repeat here is it's really hard to make a lot of these so as you brought up in the 90s uh, you can see a lot more MMA or jiu-jitsu styled submission grappling game worked into professional wrestling now that a more mainstream audience were aware of how this stuff really looks. And honestly, it's tough to make a lot of it look good. The thing that I, I specify, triangle chokes in, in professional wrestling, 95% of them are fucking awful. But it is important to acknowledge when these guys are actually doing uh, good work. And I thought the grappling was pretty good throughout this match. Are you trying to insinuate that the Undertaker's Google Plata is does not look good? Uh, it's not the worst one. I'll give him that, but it's uh, it, could, it could use some work. <laughs> uh, back to back to this match. Uh, Masao rolls to the ropes, and both men then start trading kicks with one another. With uh, Masao surprising everyone by landing a couple of really stiff kicks to Kawada's back, so kind of taking a page out of out of Kawada's uh, playbook here. Uh, he follows up with elbows to Kawada's back and then does a monkey flip. Uh, all, all this is just working over Kawada's back. And it's a really smart strategy that he, he pretty much sticks to throughout the middle portion of this match, Eric. Um, yeah, he does. And let me tell you, some of these strikes are absolutely brutal. Like they made me cringe, especially the, the ones that really got me were the standing elbows to the spine. These looked fucking painful. It's, it's, I mean, <laughs> the, the the story is he he like you know he calloused his elbow to the point where it's like it's like made of stone. Uh, I can buy that. <laughs> <laughs> that was the story that they would put it through through commentary. Usually, I buy it. <laughs> um, I don't know, but I don't know how how true that is. You know, you know, Kobashi. One of his legit training techniques was would be to like do do lariats and chops to like a street lamp. Oh my, there are MMA fighters who've done similar things. And I always think it's uh, insane, but maybe part of it's psychological. I don't know. Um, Masala follows up uh, with, uh, with the, with the back work with using a Boston crab and, and some kicks all to further damage Kawada's lower back here. Uh, and like I said before, this is all set up for, for a tiger driver that he wants to probably use a little bit later on in the match. Um, Masawa also hits a rib breaker and gets a, a quick one count on Kawada just to maybe fuck with his mind. He then from there applies a camel clutch on, on Kawada. Uh, he follows up with more elbow strikes on Kawada's back and kind of, it then kind of moves into this kind of a weird looking like modified single leg crab where I, I don't think he really gets a really good hold of, of his leg so it looks kind of like kind of a uh, i don't know kind of weak in my opinion uh, positioning was a bit off on that one i agree uh kawada gets to the ropes masawa hits a vertical suplex and goes back to sticking a knee into kawada's back and uh i don't know my i kind of made this note here eric that this is all really smart on masawa's part if a little uninspiring for me like i i was kind of like okay it's not bad i just don't find it like that exciting because I, I i just feel it's like okay he's just doing kind of the same thing but just a little bit differently each time but it's it's not to me super exciting this this kind of control segment from misawa i understand that i i feel like um i i personally don't mind a slow pace as long as it eventually picks up and there's a story being told and that's kind of where i felt uh personally on this one as well but i've heard that a lot like uh, especially uh, if, we're, if we want to relate it to a modern day performer i feel like that's a criticism that kazuchika okada gets a lot and maybe it's fair 
Yeah, I mean, like they will have like I also had I'm thinking about this match in, in a context of the the other matches they would have against one another and which are the pace is different in future matchups than it is in this one, yeah. especially for this uh this middle portion because it does pick up. It does, yeah. Uh, but back to the match, he Kawada gets back to the ropes and Misawa goes to Irish whip him, but you know, Kawada reverses it on him and Kawada hits this beautiful spinning kick to Misawa's face, which gets him a two count on Misawa. But I again going back to like how agile Kawada is, like this thing is just back kick, the spinning back kick, the precision, the the height of which he gets his leg up to hit Misawa in the face, just absolutely beautiful and again for a man his size he's very very limber he's very very agile and and this kick absolutely wakes up the crowd like not that they were ever dead but during but for the more uh portion of the match where they're mostly working on Kawada's back obviously it was a bit slower uh, a bit more meticulous grappling right so the crowd's naturally a bit quieter when it gets to this point they wake up and they stay pretty crazy for the rest of this one uh, Kawada goes for the Sasori Katame, aka the, the Scorpion Deathlock, which he then turns into a bow and arrow. Uh, Masao is able to escape out of this by rolling over into a quick pin for a two count on Kawada. Uh, Masao rolls out of the ring to get a breather. And, uh, you know, and then, again, this goes back to like this is their first match. They're still tag team partners, they're still friends. Uh, while Masawa goes out of the ring, normally in later matches, Kawada would probably just try to follow him out there to like hit him with like, like a power bomb on the apron or something like that, or something that's gonna like really hurt him a lot and like we really weaken him for later on in the match. But he just waits in the ring for him to let he's he lets Masawa have this breather, probably. Um, you know, in a kayfabe sense, it, it's probably like the the biggest mistake he makes in this match. Uh, aside from working the left arm instead of the right arm, right, WH? Well, hey, listen, <laughs> I'm telling you, like, if I see that elbow pad and I know what it's for, is since I'm his tag team partner, yeah, I'm going for his biggest weapon. That's that's just me, you know. What can I say? Uh, a lot of mistakes here, and that's why he has a terrible record against Masawa. It, you know, I love, I mean, I love Kawada more than I love Masawa. But, you know, I, I cannot deny the, the truth of, of your words, Eric Marcotte. I really can't in this, in this situation right now. Uh, Kawada emulates Misawa uh, when the latter gets back in the ring. Kawada uh, attacks with forearms and elbows. He does a scoop, slam, a scoop slam senton combo, which is one of Masao's signature moves that he uses a lot in his, his matches. Uh, he then mounts Masao's back and locks in a Masao-like face lock and grinding his forearm into Masawa's nose and cheek. And, and I feel like, you know, some people who have used the, the Masawa face lock in, in later years, like most notably, uh, you know, Zeus, formerly of, of All Japan Pro Wrestling, like he would use that as his finisher. And if you have like a big enough muscular forearm, like having that stuck and grinding into your nose and cheek, it, 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 I can see it being a totally legit finisher. Um, agreed. Yeah. I, although I will admit when I was watching it uh, in this particular match, I, I was surprised by just how loud. I mean, half my notes are about the crowd here, but this was one of the loudest reactions of the entire match when this was locked in. I was like, this is incredible. Like if this happened in in front of 90 percent of crowds, this would just be viewed as a transitional hold. Right. But given the context of it, uh, it definitely worked. You can't say it didn't work. Just look at the reaction. Oh, for sure. For sure. And this is also like, you know, with, you know, lower card talent, you know, Misawa is probably getting submissions on house shows and, or, you know, like shows in, in on the undercard with like, you know, people underneath him, like in tag matches and things like that at Cork and Hall and things like that. So people are familiar that this can win, win a match if, 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 if he wants it to like, or depending on who the opponent is really. But uh, yeah, it, 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 get, it gets reaction. Um, but uh, Kawada abandons his, his emulation of Masawa's uh, tactics and he goes back to his own tactics of kicks. But, you know, Masawa is starting his comeback from this point. And, and, he, and I, I kind of get the impression that he's pretty tired of all this shit from Kawada and it just starts wailing into him with his signature elbows. So again, he's going back to what he knows best, the elbows. And, and again, these look... These look so painful <laughs> to take yes, on the eye. They looked brutal. They looked absolutely brutal. <laughs> uh, there's an Irish whip 
followed by a nice trick, a uh, nice drop kick by Misawa. Misawa goes for another Irish whip, but Kawada counters it into another beautiful looking spin kick it's it's these uh, spin kicks it's these kind of like these really agile looking uh, maneuvers using you know kawada uses with his with his legs to like really kind of you know turn the tide for him throughout the match and yeah that's a continuous theme you'll have like a period of misawa control and then kawada just hits him with one of these crazy spinning head kicks and just like that the tide's been turned uh kawada goes for a suplex masawa blocks it so kawada turns it into a fujiwara arm bar but masawa gets his foot to the ropes and and how how was kawada's fujiwara arm bar here how did it look to you i thought it looked pretty good actually and you know the arm bar is an easier one to make look good than say uh than say the uh, the dreaded triangle choke but it, it, it was a good it was a good arm bar yeah, Although, I, you know what, when, whenever the arm's fully extended, it's always a pet peeve of mine. Whenever the arm's fully extended, I'm like, you should be tapping right now, but it's just pro wrestling. It's fine. Like, like having me put in like a, a friendly arm bar and have my, and had my arm straightened out. I, I like, I, it's a pet peeve of mine. It's like, I always feel like if you're a pro wrestler and you're in and you're going to get, especially like a cross chest arm breaker. Yes. Like, like. I, I think you should never, if it's not the finish, don't, don't even just never have your arm straightened. When you, when that arm oh, is straight and they're, they're not tapping, yes. it's I like, listen, I've been in one. It, I, <laughs> I'm tapping painful. like right away. Like there's no way I'm like, not, you know, like I don't even like, and you see a real, like, you know, MMA fighters, they, they tap right away too. You know, you, you are preaching to the choir right now. It's one of my things. You know, if I'm going to give all these criticisms, I will give uh, a shout out because if there's one performer who un- understands this, it's a uh, current performer that is, it's Shingo Takagi. The man understands that you tap out immediately when an arm bar is fully locked in. I, I have yeah, to I give mean, him a shout out. One of the, the biggest offenders of this is like not, not necessarily being in one. But but using this as a like as a potential you know finisher is Yuji Nagata. Like I don't know how many times I've seen him use a straight arm bar, like or a cross chest arm breaker, and and they don't tap, even though it's like he's extended their arm. It's just like, dude, don't 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 even don't even let you know, don't even agree to like you straightening their arm out. Like just tell them, like just struggle, struggle, you know. Anyway, his technique must be off. That must be it. Well, I mean, he, his technique is all about, you know, being full of uh, blue justice, but maybe not for actually submitting anyone. But I, hey, you know what? I've seen him. I've seen him win matches using an arm bar and stuff like that. So it, it's just like then he should always win an, a match with an arm bar. That's that's what I feel like. Uh, where am I on my notes? OK, there, there's a strike exchange between. Uh, Masao and Kawada, which Masao wins with using his elbows, of course. Uh, but Kawada is not done, and he jumps right back up and fires back with elbows of his own, to which Masao answers with a spin kick, basically telling Kawada he can play let's steal each other's moves as well as Kawada. And uh, Masao goes on a streak of moves and strikes, running elbow, then a diving elbow, then a tiger driver attempt, but Kawada counters that by charging into him into the corner. Uh, there's another strike exchange that ensues, and this Budokan crowd is well up for it. They are, they are like you can hear them like stomping their feet. They're cheering each 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 man's names. They're clapping, you, and there's just a just a sense of electricity running throughout this building. And that's something you create by producing first time matchups between stars. Something that's hard to do, increasingly hard to do in the modern era. Well, I mean. <laughs> I mean, everyone works for one company or or two companies in America, so it's kind of hard. To well, even these. even in Japan, it's uh, if you look at rosters like the NOAA, New Japan, All Japan, it feels like everyone's wrestled each other a trillion times. Yeah, I mean, and, and you... there's not to say there isn't still some matchups that they haven't touched, but just when you have smaller rosters running shows so frequently, it's it's natural, right? It is. I, I think that's why you see a plethora of like, you know, like tag matches on, on, or on, you know, house show cards, you know? Uh, but it, it's, you know, like that's, yeah. I mean, you're totally right. The point you're making is like, you create this kind of atmosphere, you create, you know, you generate box office by, by giving fans like matches that they want to see, but maybe haven't, got to see and you know it's the first time doing it then you're probably gonna have a very very good gate 
for that show. So. Exactly. They're, they're going to see something that they've perhaps always wanted to see, but it's never happened before. Uh, Kawada goes for a kick to the face, but Masawa dodges it. Masawa fires back with his own jumping kicks. Kawada retaliates with a running layer to the back of the head. This, this was brutal. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it was. There was a lot of that going around. Yeah, one thing I want to say about Kawada, and this is something I, I made a point in my the last show, is that Kawada, like, he, he it's always said, oh, he's the kick guy. He's not the kick guy. He's not, he because, like, his, his offense compared to everyone else on this roster is very, very, like, um, you know, uh, varied. Like, he has a lot of different things that he likes to do with his strikes. Like, he's not, he does the elbows. He does the forearms. He does um lariats and things like that but like you know what other people don't do as well as him are like these running like charging kicks like you know what like masahiro chono would call his yakuza kick but we we don't use that term for kawada because like he's not masahiro chono like i don't like when people refer to anyone else but masahiro chono doing a yakuza kick because no that's that's his what he calls it and that's what like you should refer to it as like this is the running high kick. That's what I just call it for Kawada. Kawada's running high kick is very unique to him, but it's not like he doesn't use other people's, not other people's, but like he'll chop, he'll larry at people. He'll use his elbows to hit people in the face as well. That's one of the things like I really like latch onto with Kawada is that he doesn't like kind of, um, what am I going to, what, what's the phrase I want to say? He doesn't like limit himself or just put himself in like a certain sandbox, so to speak. No, he's very versatile and that's on display in a match like this. Um, from here, uh, like he, uh, so from this running lariat to the back of the head, Kawada goes for, for, for a pin, but Masao kicks out at two. Kawada then power bombs uh, Masao, but uh, oh, he tries to power bomb Masao, but Masao reaches the ropes uh, or no, wait, did he get the power bomb from here? Do you remember? Um, I may be a bit lost in my notes, but I have he gets it and it, there's a big near fall. But okay, so I uh, he yes, he gets it. Masao reaches the ropes to to break the count. Uh, there are more kicks from Kawada, uh, and then he goes for another power bomb, but Masawa blocks it, so Kawada kicks him in the face again. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of that. <laughs> Uh, Kawada finally uh, hits another power bomb, but this time he goes for his folding power bomb, which is like one of his finishers. But Masawa just barely, barely kicks out of it, and Budokan is just going crazy at this point. But like my 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 criticism here, Eric, is that like you know what, if it, like he shouldn't have hit the folding power bomb, he shouldn't have been successful because I think that's a move that should be protected because he does actually. You know, the first time he ever pins Masawa in his entire career, it's using the the folding power bomb, and I just feel like got to You got to keep that move like you know special and like you protect it. Uh, if they were going to do it, maybe they could have done it a bit later into the match too. Maybe that would have uh, helped as a as a proper near fall. I mean, going into this, I knew the match length, so that's obviously going to affect me buying it. But I see what you're saying. Uh, Kawada presses his advantage at this point with a variety of offense, including a body slam, a diving knee drop, and uh, and, and and like these are all uh, by the, the the diving knee drop. By the way, is to Masao's head, but yeah, <laughs> Masao is able to survive this. He kicks out at two in the pin attempt. Uh, Kawada goes for his signature stretch plum uh, submission hold that he that he. Uh, you know, was inspired to take from uh, Plum Marco, uh, a very famous Joshi who invented this move. Uh, but Masao is able to escape the stretch plum by reaching the ropes. Kawada goes for the stretch plum again, but Masao throws him off. But uh, Kawada's third time is the charm, and, and Kawada gets the stretch plum back on Masao and just starts cranking on it. I, I love it when he, like, you know, there's a point where, you know, in a Kawada match, he gets that stretch plum on again, like not the first time he'll do it, but the maybe the second or third time. And he'll just like start twisting, you know, his opponent's body, like turning him to like a kind of a human corkscrew. Oh, they milk this one to the fullest potential, having him just uh, miss out on it a couple of times and then locking it in uh, to this extent where he's practically twisting Masala. They, they capitalized to the fullest on this on this submission. 
Yeah, Nasawa's only chance is is to to reach the ropes, and and he does, and 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 I actually both guys get get out of the ring in in exhaustion at this point in the match, and 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 the crowd is is going nuts for for all of this. Uh, Kawada is the first to recover. And he throws Masao back into the ring and hits him with another lariat for the one, two, oh, kick out. Uh, Kawada hits a running high kick to Masao's face, but goes uh, to the well once too many times as uh, as uh, as he catches him. Like Masao catches him from when he tries it again and hits an elbow, but Kawada responds to this elbow with another running high kick. So they're just trading like their signature strikes at this point here, Eric. They do, and it works completely. Every time he gets one of those running high kicks, or specifically the spinning wheel kick, it completely gets the audience, and it creates a, a momentum change in the match. When you're doing it in a more of an exchange like this, it's a bit of a different scenario, but still, I thought it was a really great part of the match. Uh, Masawa avoids losing the match by getting his foot on the ropes. Uh, Kawada's... Uh, attempts a German suplex, which is countered by Masawa going for one of his own. Kawada escapes this German suplex attempt that's being tried on him, and he tries for another lariat, but Masawa ducks and is able to hit a bridging German suplex, but it's not enough to keep Kawada down for the three. Uh, Masawa then goes for his Tiger Driver. One, two. Kawada barely kicks out in time and and again like this is something we're just going to keep on saying eric until the <laughs> end of this match this crowd is like biting on all these big bombs that masawa and kawada are delivering to one another they're buying they're buying into like the fact that this could this could be the end of the match this could be either like masawa retaining his title or or kawada winning the title from masawa but no like and and it just builds it doesn't even like hit a hit a dipping point or anything like this crowd their 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 investment in this match is just just gets deeper and deeper and deeper yeah we sound like a bit of a broken record but it's the truth the crowd makes it, this the crowd sends this match to another level uh they're so invested in every single near fall they bite on everything they could have done a finger poke of doom and the crowd would have bit on a three count it was it was ridiculous it would have killed the territory like it, it did WCW the though. Yeah. you know uh can i just say just as an aside like i understand like i i follow kevin nash on on, on the twitter and i usually agree with pretty much everything he says but i have to say like people who like, I, I, I think are ironically like, oh, what a great man. Like I'm like, he, he destroyed WCW. He helped destroy it, you know, with his book. <laughs> so not uh, that great. I you know. think there were so many factors going into this destruction of WCW that they just, you know, they, they give big cap uh, a pass, a pass, but yeah. I don't <laughs> cause I'm not, I'm not uh, co-opted by Kevin Nash. I like Kevin Nash. Don't get me wrong. Like I like like his views on the world, very similar to my own. But hey, like him, Russo, Bischoff, Hogan, they they all contributed, and Kevin Nash contributed to that as well. Anyways, back to this match. Masawa goes for his signature face lock, and Kawada is able uh, to get himself to the ropes to 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 escape this. Masawa though uh, does maintain his control and locks in another face lock, which leads to a pin attempt. But Kawada still has some fight left in him. Uh, but Masao won't give up his strategy, Eric, and goes for another face lock. But but this time, Kawada reaches the rope yet again. And, and again, like, you know, like every time Masao goes for this face lock, the, the crowd thinks, okay, this is it. He's going to get it this time. He's going to get Kawada to submit. But Kawada won't give in to the face lock. And it's, it's just great stuff. It's just like, I, I, I love when people just go for the same submission hold again and again, like, you know, with the fact, with the idea that, oh, okay, this time I'm going to lock it on and I've worn him down enough where it's going to work this time. Yeah, the accumulation of damage. They go back to these uh, same spots, whether we're talking about their signature submissions or even the spinning head kicks and forearms. They they continuously go back to these spots to increasingly bigger reactions from the crowd. It's just a testament to the storytelling of their expression throughout the match, really. 
Uh, but Kawada is, uh, is kind of just laying on the mat here and he's in a prone position, which makes him a perfect target for the, uh, Mitsuhara Masawa frog splash, uh, which, which he hits successfully, but Kawada kicks out and rolls out of the wing, uh, rolls out of the ring, which turns out to be a bad idea for him, Eric, because Masawa does not <laughs> let up on the attack and hits the ropes on the other side and then flies through the top and middle rope. And hits Kawada with this awesome, awesome looking elbow suicida. Incredible. Uh, listen, he catches Kawada here, but Misawa smashes his right arm and right shoulder right into that guardrail. And I'm just thinking at this point in the match and this guy's size, oh, it, it looked brutal. Like, I, I can't even imagine the pain that you would feel in your shoulder after doing that. Uh, Budokan Hall is chanting both for Misawa and Kawada at this point. Misawa! Kawada, it's like it's like not like a not like a cheesy dueling, you know, chant like you see in like modern wrestling, like you know, or thank God we don't hear anything stupid like both these guys, both these guys. I hate that fucking chant <laughs> with a passion. We can jump right into like a, a mid match nineties uh, all Japan. You deserve it, chant. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you something, Eric. You ever we ever go to the same like indie show? I don't know if you would find this annoying or amusing, but I will just eviscerate the fans around me. <laughs> oh, I've heard stories. <laughs> like, I wouldn't say necessarily say anything to people around me, but I will maybe like say to you, this guy's a fucking idiot. Or those people over there, they're chanting something stupid. And it's like Darwin's waiting room over there. Evolution stopped. You know, that's how I feel. So. Something to look forward to, Eric, to go to a, a wrestling show with me in oh, person. Yeah. One day, one day when uh, so, when someone comes to Toronto, maybe. Yes. No, I mean, even like, you know, better an indie show. Indie shows are wonderful for me for, for just taking shots at uh, the other people in the building. <laughs> Picking apart these poor audience members who are trying to help these uh, indie promotions thrive. You know? You're sick. I, I, I help. I pay. I would pay. You know the admission. You know. Anyways, Budokan Hall is chanting both for Masawa and Kawada at this point. Uh, Masawa presses the, his advantage and lands a running elbow smash for another two count. Uh, Masawa again tries, uh, but uh, for the the running elbow, but Kawada is able to jump, jump up, and he hits the Gamangiri to Masawa's face. Another amazing jumping high kick from Kawada showing off his amazing agility, especially at this point in the match. Like, he must be fucking exhausted. Uh, definitely. They're, we're deep into the match at this point, and these guys are still doing some ridiculously athletic things. I mean, it, we said this earlier, but when you look at these guys, uh, the athletic feats that they're capable of this deep into a match like this, it, it really is remarkable. Uh, Kawada hits Masao with uh, some kicks and then goes for a series of uh, more kicks, but this time to the leg, and then he attempts a dragon suplex. Masao blocks it, but Kawada nails him with another layer to the back of the head. Poor, poor, poor back of Masao's head here. Uh, then he hits a bridging German suplex that Kawada does, uh, by the way. Uh, Masao kicks out of that, and then uh, a dragon suplex from Kawada is successful. This time, so this is his second attempt at trying the dragon suplex. He hits it this time, but Masao won't stay up, won't stay down. I mean, and and he kicks out from the pin attempt. That may uh, have been the biggest reaction of the entire match. It, it was up there at the very least. The, the kicking out of the dragon suplex. Yeah. Well, I mean, that dragon suplex did look like it, it pretty much knocked, knocked Masao out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kawada applies a face lock. Uh, and then transitions into a sleeper with a body scissors, but Masao is able to roll over to the ropes to break the hold. Kawada kicks uh, Masao's face, and that only serves to anger him. And then Masao retaliates with more elbows. Masao goes for a spin kick, but Kawada grabs his foot. But Masao then kicks him in the face with his free leg. So Kawada, like, so just so again, to reiterate, Masao goes for a spin kick. Kawada catches his leg his foot, but Masala jumps up and then kicks Kawada in the face with his, the, the leg that is not being held 
by by Kawada in in this sequence, which is great. I thought it's just what a what a what a sequence just just flows so nicely. Uh, this was a great spot after that spinning spinning head kick, uh, mostly from Kawada, but from both men had been such a big part of the match, done so many times to this point that you play off that by having Misawa actually jump and kick him in the head with his other leg after Kawada catches it. This was really a smart spot. There's there's a rough looking running elbow from Misawa to the back of Kawada's head, which like legit looks like it, it made Kawada loopy, Eric. I wouldn't have been surprised. Like these guys were laying it in with the elbows, and whenever you hit a guy in the back of the head, that's always uh, that's actually never good. I'm saying. No, that's not good. No, no. Uh, th- there's a there's a pin attempt from Masao. One, two, Kawada kicks out. There's a tiger driver. One, two, nope. Bridging tiger suplex. One, two, no. Ms. Kawada will not stay down, Eric, and and the crowd's going nuts. Masao goes to pick Kawada up. But uh, Dangerous K fires back with kicks to Masawa's head. Kawada just won't give up. You know, uh, like that's the thing. Like that's what gets like he's already over with this crowd. But this like just takes it to a different level where they're now like invested in him. If he wins, like if, even if it's like Masawa's only defense of this title reign, if that's like where this like we have our sliding doors moment, like Baba says, you know what? Let's give Kawada the win just to make it equal put them on a level playing field if if i don't think fans would have like been against it you know they wanted to see missile win the title for so long but if if, he, if kawada won from him in his first defense like i think i think they they would have been fine because of the the performance that kawada gives in this match is just amazing uh, from the entrances, I mean, not that the crowd was anti Misawa, far from it, but they were behind Kawada in this match. They wanted the live crowd, at the very least, they wanted to see him win. Kawada struggles to get up, so he kicks at Misawa from his uh, seated position. Uh, Misawa breaks through Kawada's attempts to stay alive in this match and hits another running elbow and then follows up with the tiger, not the tiger driver, but with the tiger suplex. And he goes for the one two and three and he wins the match eric he he beats he finally beats kawada with the the running elbow and the tiger suplex combination in 29 minutes in 52 seconds so basically a 30 minute match and uh and but we should note that in this in this tiger suplex it like kawada was actually very close to to the, the ropes in fact his foot had touched one of the ropes, but uh, the referee did not see this, so he counted the the uh, the one, two, three. So you know, like I think it's really smart because like Kawhi can say, "Hey, uh, I actually, you know, like if you watch the footage, I don't, I don't actually get you know pinned cleanly because I, my foot was on the rope." But I don't know it might be one of those instances where like you know it's not just enough to touch the touch rope; you have to maintain contact with the rope to break the hold. It's a really good uh, conclusion in terms of creating something for them to work with in the future. And let me say, I, I am typically not a fan of the match ending and the guy's foot is on the ropes and the ref just didn't see it. They did it to perfection here because he just kind of touches it. Like the referee wouldn't see it in this, in this scenario. It, it was, if it was intentional, which I'm assuming it was, it was done to perfection here. Well, I mean, the thing is, is like, you know, a lot of Japanese, referees are taught to like treat it like a shoot so if they don't kick out because like if he doesn't see it if that wasn't the plan which you know maybe in the heat of the moment yeah the referee kyohei wada the legendary all japan ref of this of this era could have just like forgot who knows i i don't i think i don't think it was like i don't i don't think Masao was gonna lose the title in his first defense here you know and i i i imagine you know kawada's foot being on it the rope maybe was brought up, but I mean, they don't, they don't have another match for like another year. Right. Like I went through how many title t- times Kawada fought for this title in, in this particular, um, like the next time he faces him is like for the triple crown is like in 93. <laughs> so about a year later. So maybe it doesn't really play into the match at all, Eric. The Perhaps there is face. no immediate rematch, but, uh, 
regardless if it was their intention for Kawada's foot to be under the rope here, it, it was done perfectly. And if it wasn't their intention, guess what? If you want to do that finish, look at the end of this match and you will see how it should be done. That's right. Exactly. Anyways, so we, we've reached the, the end of the mo- match. Uh, give us your quick thoughts overall on what you thought of Masao versus Kawada from this time. All right, I'll start by just talking briefly about the finish here. I thought the finishing sequence was a fantastic storytelling because you had Kawada, who manages, he's getting his ass kicked throughout the majority of the last five minutes. Like, it's near fall for Misawa after near fall for Misawa, and Kawada's just staying alive, right? And near the very end of the match, he's on his back, and he actually creates a moment for himself by kicking, like, off of his back, kicking Misawa over and over and over again. And Misawa's kind of hurt. But he just, he's, he's so hurt himself, he can't get back to his feet. And that allows Misawa to hit that big forearm before the ending. And I thought that was just a tremendous finish. The, and, the part where he crumbles, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it was, it was like, I don't know if I've seen that finish done before uh, quite like that. And it's one of the parts that stuck out for me the most because I thought it was just great storytelling at the end. I, I love it when it's like, you don't know if it's like, the, the, it's part of the match or if it's like a shoot right like 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 maybe he's legit cannot get up because he's so exhausted and he's so like taking so much legit damage throughout this match from masawa that he's like i can't stand up actually now <laughs> that, you know what that wouldn't shock me either but the thing with kawada is that he is so famous for like this for being such an amazing like seller like especially with what they call delayed selling where like he'll get hit with a move he'll be he'll be fine for one or two seconds maybe he get to his own move but then he's like it catches up to him and he just starts like selling it then i just think he's he's a master of that and and so like i can totally see it being like it was on purpose and and he's actually he's fine relatively speaking and uh yeah it's just, it's just another reason why i love kawada so much as, as a wrestler uh, any other thoughts uh the other big note i had here throughout the match is i thought that Misawa's storytelling with his expressions with his body language really from the opening bell until the end uh was really encapsulating throughout the match i mean i you can sense uh his frustrations building at kawada's uh aggression early on and how that frustration eventually couples with exhaustion towards the end of the match as Kawada keeps kicking out and he's and he's really selling it with his expression with his body language when he's trying to get more aggressive when he's just trying to put him away I thought he did an amazing job here yeah um yeah great points and uh for me I like I I if I was giving this a a, you know a, a five star you know match rating um using that scale uh, of five stars, I would, I would give this like a four, four and a quarter. Um, not, you know, a great match. I do think this is a great match. I don't think it's like on like as great as what it's going to become this rivalry, but this, this is really great. I, I will say like, again, like to reiterate the middle portion, I do feel drags a little like where, where Kawada is working over the, the non-dominant arm and MSL is working on Kawada's back. Uh, but you know it, it does play into like later on in the match and but man, my god that the last what i don't know five to seven minutes is just a- incredible pacing and and crowd investment in this match is is off the charts and and i think like in context it this match really can be appreciated as the prelude to what the next eight years or so between uh, Masao and Kawada will will end up looking like in the ring. If I were to give it a star rating, I'd probably go with a four point five. The only thing that really held it back for me was, uh, like I said, I don't mind a slower pace, but if you're gonna spend nearly fifteen minutes working the left arm of Masawa, I would want that to impact the story a bit more throughout the final ten minutes, and it was kind of a non-factor towards the end of the match. So yeah, that, yeah be my which one is criticism. weird because both these guys are really good for like putting that extra detail in their psychology. So the fact that like again, like I didn't bring necessarily bring this up, so I'm glad you did. Is that it doesn't really play into anything. Like it doesn't really factor into not necessarily the finish, but like into the later parts of this match as far as the storytelling goes. So 
And I was again like, why, why even bother doing that stuff? You exactly. Know? If you're gonna so. spend so much time on it, and it doesn't factor into the end stretch, then it makes it seem more like you're just kind of filling time for the sake of filling time, right? That's right. I think so. Well, anyways, any other thoughts before we before we move on and, and kind of get to the the closing stretch of, of this particular episode, Eric? No, I think that's all I had to say. This is a, was a really, really uh, great match, great storytelling. And most of all, one last time, a great crowd. A great crowd. So, so, so cannot, cannot wait for crowds to be like this again in the future. I wonder between our two recordings of, of this podcast, how many times we said great crowd or this crowd reacted. Or... You, you know, you know what? I don't think in, in the, the, our first attempt at this, I don't think we got to the point where we were like really praising crowd that much. So, so maybe it, it was all good. It was all meant to be that we have this, 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 this take, this attempt to just put the crowd over as much as we put over both Masawa and Kawada in this match. So uh, with that being said, let, let's wrap it up here. And Eric, uh, where can people find more of your fine work if, if they enjoy listening to you talk about uh, Misawa versus Kawada with me? Uh, all my written work and podcast appearances can be found at postwrestling.com. If you want to follow me on Twitter, it'd be Eric Marcotte 705 And finally, if you just want to talk to me and various other post personalities, the post community at large, head to postwrestling.com slash discord. We have a pretty large thriving community there. There, You can talk about wrestling. You can talk about MMA. You can talk about whatever you want, really. So pop in I, and say hi. I, I, I myself do not do discord at all. I don't have the time. I, I feel I spend too much time as it is on, on social media. So, uh, but I, I have heard good things about the, the post wrestling discord. It's, it's not like some uh, weird echo chamber for a cult of personality like some other discords i've i've heard about uh so it's uh you know i think are you one of the moderators of that discord i am yeah and and you, and you keep it you try to keep it uh positive right um i mean positive in the respectable sense you're allowed to say whatever you want to, if you think i'm in there being positive about the pfl you got another thing coming <laughs> no not the pfl but you know, no, like it's, it's a well, it's the post community, right? And in yeah. general, I'd say the post community is a very positive place, fostered largely off of uh, the environment that John Way have created over the years, right? Well, I mean, this is why I probably don't go to Discord. I I'd uh, toxify it up. <laughs> You're always welcome in the MMA channel, where you can just hate everything with us. <laughs> oh, really? No, I want to go in the pro wrestling uh, channel. Uh, and just... I would love to see you make an appearance in there. Okay. Like you better watch out, you know, so and so from so and so plays or wherever, you know. Like I will come to destroy your cold takes on everything. Well, there you go. I think that's a sell. That one day, one day, WH will make his way to the post wrestling Discord. I know Phil might. Phil maybe Phil's gonna kick me out of there. I don't know. Your partner Phil he Turtok. He hasn't kicked me out yet. You'll be fine. Oh, there you go. <laughs> what endorsement right there <laughs> all right well yeah you can follow eric uh, all his work he's exclusive to postwrestling.com does most of his stuff talking about uh, mma but occasionally like like today he'll he'll come on talk about talk about some professional wrestling myself you can find me at uh, at twitter on uh with uh, the the uh the username at wh park nine that's the number nine you can uh, also find most of my work is also at post wrestling uh the long and winding railroad this show which by the way you can get a really nice cool t-shirt that is very popular with a lot of people in wrestling itself <laughs> eddie kingston <laughs> uh jonah you know they they you know more people are going to get that shirt i think it's 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 spreading like a virus all over professional wrestling eric I am literally wearing that shirt as we speak. I am literally also wearing this shirt as we speak. It's a shame we're not on, uh, we're not on the doing the video gimmick for this particular episode. Then, and I'll but, assume every listener is wearing their shirt as well. Listen, you can buy it at postwrestlestore.postwrestling.com. Uh, also, I do every month. I do the the post Perez show. Uh, sometimes with John Pollock, sometimes with Karen Peterson, sometimes with somebody else. But uh, 
yeah, we're going to have another episode of that coming on soon. Uh, what else do I do? MCU later, which you have been a guest on. I have. And, and we're, we're in the midst of doing our, our Miss Marvel review. So, uh, you know, we got a couple more episodes of that left. That's been a fun show to talk about so far. And what else we got? What else do I do? Oh, if, if you want to hear me somewhere else, I also do a, a Star Wars centric podcast reviewing uh, the Obi-Wan Kenobi series on, on Disney Plus. Uh, and uh, we just wrapped that up, me and JP Houlihan over at Grapple. Uh, that's on the free feeds. You don't have to be a member of the, their, their Patreon necessarily, but hey, I, there's a lot of good stuff on their Patreon. I, I do recommend if you have a couple of dollars to spare, a couple of great British pounds to spare, some some sterling. Is that what it's called? I don't know. Their, their uh, currency I also confuses don't me. know. If you're looking cur- for help here, I don't yeah. know either. The currency, the currency over in the United Kingdom kind of confuses me. But hey, give 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 uh, Benno JP uh, a heads up. Let let give give him a give him a try is what I would say. But uh, I do uh, the show. Hello there, over there at uh, talking about Star Wars. I'm with Kenobi, but we're gonna we're gonna continue. We we finished Kenobi. We're gonna when the uh, the Andor series comes up on Disney Plus, we're gonna review that. You know, JP might start watching Star Wars Rebels, and uh, we'll we'll do maybe season recaps of those. You know, who knows? There's a lot of if you want to hear me talk about Star Wars, that's the place to go. Did you did you know, Eric? I I pitched. I kind of half jokingly pitched doing a Star Wars podcast with Way. Uh, this is the way, right? This is the way. <laughs> I've told you this story. I I listened to your podcast, WH. I know all the stories. Oh, you listened to Hello There? Of course. Did oh uh, Did you like when I eviscerated Episode Five? I haven't seen the episode five, so I just agreed with you. You know, so I, 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 WH knows. Oh, but you listen to the, the review oh, yeah. of it. You haven't I, watched the episode? Even if I don't watch a show, I usually listen to the review of like, oh, well. the you can just skip episode five because it sucks. There you go. It is, it is some terrible writing. Anyways, I, this, this show has gone on too long. But uh, hey, everyone, uh, Post Perez, Long and Winding Roll Road. There are t shirts for both shows, store.postwrestling.com. Go, go, go check them out. They're both excellent designs uh mcu later you know we 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 are we are, we are thinking about a t-shirt for that for that show like you know i i haven't heard too much i maybe i'm gonna bring it up with way tomorrow when we record mcu later but uh keep your eye out for that on store up uh hello there over at spot over grapple spotlight and uh yeah i don't know eric uh you know thanks for coming on by the way yeah, no, of course. Uh, we, we practically did two podcasts today. I say that's good work. Listen, you know who's <laughs> going to be the most upset about the lost audio is John Cena. Oh yeah, he because is. the we, amount we of about him for a while, the, the the amount of praise you and I both heaped on him, would just he's just going to be sad that he's never going to hear us saying so many nice things about him. That's yeah, true. Uh, sorry, Cena. Maybe next time. No, th- that was it. That was a one time. One time opportunity for Sino. Anyways, the, for all the listeners on behalf of Eric, I want to say thank you for supporting the show, for listening, for downloading, for for buying the T-shirt, and wearing it at, at at on TV, at indie shows, at your supermarket, wherever. And until the next episode, until next time, I just want to say goodbye. <laughs>